The Beyond Meat's mission is, is super simple. It's to build meat from plants. What do you say to people who say you're an animal rights activist working within capitalism? Well, that's a good question. Um, Thank you so much sure. for doing the, uh, the interview. Sure. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Can you tell me um, about the new relationship with Tyson Foods? Sure. You get right to the point. <laughs> um, so it was an investment only at this point. Uh, and it's something that was the outcome of about four years of discussion um, along the way. Um, so we um, initially were working with Hillshire Brands, which is a company they acquired. Um, and, you know, from the beginning and to today, the idea has been that, um, you know, we want to be part of the mainstream discussion in terms of protein at the center of the plate, and we don't want to be a, a niche uh, product. We want to get outside of the meat alternative case where, you know, almost no mainstream consumer shops and into the meat section where, you know, the majority of people go for their protein. And in fact, to change the meat section from being about meat to being about protein. Um, and so, you know, you've seen a set of, uh, of um, deliberate steps uh, on behalf of, of uh, the company to, 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 to get out of that niche and into the mainstream, get into the meat case, partner with a company like Tyson. All of those things are part of the same goal. How do you get into a meat part of the store? Like legally, like right. logistically, has that been a, right. a barrier? You know, it's really interesting. The the um, this, the so we tried to do that first in 2011 and 2012, and, and we just weren't ready. Our products weren't ready, um, and I don't think that the grocery store was ready either. And um, you know, so we, we kind of retrenched and, and went back and began much more uh, aggressive development around um, the basic idea of the company. And that the, the idea of the company is really that you can create a piece of meat directly from plants. Like that that's the core of who we are as a company. Um, if you look at the composition of meat, that the answer becomes pretty clear. You know, it's, it's basically at a very high level. It's, it's fat, it's protein, and it's water. Maybe a little more amino acids, lipids, very small amount of carbohydrates, almost non-existent, you know, trace minerals, and then water. And all of those things can be sourced outside the animal, and they can be uh, placed in the same architecture that they are within in animal muscle or meat. You know, those things are knowable. You know, you can look at them in a textbook in animal agriculture. You can put a chicken breast in an MRI and, and begin to understand its structure. Uh, and so I think the days where you have to use an animal to create a piece of meat are rapidly uh, um, uh, diminishing. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we started with, that, with that, that, that premise, didn't have the products we needed to be able to get through into the meat case. And I think finally with this burger... We've gotten close enough to an animal protein equivalent that we sort of gain entry into that meat case, and and, and so you know, our task now is to continue to make that better uh, so that we we uh, can expand our offering. What criteria were you given uh, before you were able to do that? Right, it was more, um, it was uh, less organized than that in the sense that um, you just kind of know when you know, like when it. But, but, so we initially had, uh, to give an example, one of the early meetings we had um, with meat buyers was here in Southern California where we were a major supermarket chain. About 10 people in a room like this, all of them meat buyers from different stores, and we gave them this current burger. And they loved it. I mean, it was like a home run, right? And, and they were like, oh, it's better than a lot of grass-fed beef that we serve. And so we were like, we left the meeting like high-fiving, oh, it's going to work, fantastic. But a week later, we get a call saying, you know what, the regional vice president said this has to go in the meat alternative section because the meat alternative is not meat. And so we said, we're not going to sell it to you then. And so, so we have resisted selling to anybody that's, that's not going to put it in the meat case. Someone in the Rocky Mountain region of the United States, Colorado, Utah, et cetera, uh, said, you know, we're going we're gonna to put this in the meat case. And so it's got, Tom Rich was the guy's name is a guy's name, and uh, he made that very bold decision, so put us in the meat case, and the results have been ridiculous. It's been amazing to see the consumer uptake. Financially, have you had to compromise anything for being kind of a little bit stubborn like that, or are you playing the long game? Long game, for sure. For sure. You just don't, I mean, to win in the mid alternative case is to win a narrow victory. You know, sure. It, it, you really want to 
you know, be patient enough to get into the meat case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How important is it for plant-based companies to work with the meat industry instead of against them? Right. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, like, I think you, know, you may have heard me say, uh, you know, meat is really something that's part of who we are. Like, we, you know, we, we evolved consuming meat. We, we, we evolved because of the consumption of meat. You know, it changed our bodies and, you know, led, led to the size of our brains and, you know, our physiology, et cetera. Um, so, you know, to be against meat, you know, I think is an awkward position. Uh, a, a really productive position is to be for a different type of meat, a plant-based meat. You know, and and uh, I think that you can rally people around, but to try to build a, a mainstream brand telling people to not eat what they love, like doesn't sound like a good idea to me. You know, so let let's celebrate what's great about meat, but let's like everything else we've done, like this phone right here. You know, this is a phone. Like you're not gonna tell me it's a fake phone. It just doesn't it's not a landline, right? And so can we move off of this distinction that meat has to come from an animal and, and, and get more about the functionality of meat, the composition of meat, and if, we, and if we can do that, we can solve this problem. Beyond the company's financial gains and ambitions, what are the big benefits of the company? Right. So the four of them are articulated behind you, which which you can't see on camera, but I'll walk through them. Um, and we call these the four horsemen. And and uh, for the consumer, it really begins with human health. You know, the the we believe that that um, you know these products are are healthier for you, um, and whether you look at you know diabetes heart disease, cancer, et cetera, all the things you've probably been focusing on in the last week and a half and beyond, of course, um, you know, we can make a really valuable contribution in that regard. And then you go to climate. And I have a very strong belief in the work that um, Robert Goodlin has done in this and, and his partner, Jeff and Nang, around the role of livestock in climate change. And, and you know, they didn't have um, a, a dog in the fight, so to speak. They, they were with the World Bank at the time, so not a left-leaning organization by any means. They did an exhaustive study that said, look, it's about 51% of greenhouse gas emissions contributed to livestock. Maybe that number's too high, but it's, it's certainly not 4%. You know, it's certainly not just 10%. And one of the things that was fascinating to me about that work was uh, they counted the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, all livestock is breathing, and when they breathe, they're respiring carbon. And the UN doesn't count that. They say, well, that's part of the carbon cycle. But their point is there's no natural number of animals on the Earth's surface. They're all breathing. Carbon size is broken because we're taking down so much uh, of, the, of the sink. Um, and then so, you, and then so you go from climate change to, to natural resources, and you look at, you know, here in California, there's a water shortage. I went down to a restaurant a couple of years ago down the street from my house, and on the menu uh, it said we are no longer offering water unless you ask for it because of the water shortage. But then you look at the menu, it's like all steak. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. like, let's focus on the issues, right? And then lastly, is animal welfare. It really depends on, you know, where you come out on that question. But I think more and more people um, are beginning to see the world the way uh, that a guy that, that is from, from, from your home country, uh, Darwin, uh, uh, laid it out. And, you know, he was, this was back in, he published The Origin of Species in, you know, the 1850s or so. Um, and, uh, you know, he was right that there's this grand, um, that we, we share life, right? With, with all the other forms on earth, right? And that we're not distinct from them. And that we have similar, you know, uh, central nervous systems, et cetera. Uh, and so more and more people are coming around to that, but that's a personal issue. That's a personal preference. When you say that's a personal preference, do you mean you don't take that argument into meetings with investors? Uh, or even with customers. It, it really, it's, 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 it's almost religion. Like it's, it's you just can't, that, that's something that I think is really up for someone else to work through on their own and not, not for a company like mine to have, to, to have at the forefront. So do you actively try and separate yourself from communities like the vegan community? Not at all. No, no. But I just think it's everyone has their role. Yeah, you know? sure. I, yeah, I think, yeah. So um, you talked about the benefits just then. Is that what motivated you to start yes. Young Meat? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And that was in 2000 and... 2009. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how many series of funding have you had? So we've had quite a bit, um, which is very fortunate. Um, you know, we started um, just with friends of my own, my own investment and then friends and family. And, and then I think something very important happened to the company in, in 2010. Uh, a group named Kleiner Perkins reached out. Uh, and they're a, uh, a venture fund in Silicon Valley. And, you know, they were um, way ahead of all of their colleagues in the Valley thinking about food as a way to solve problems um, and to invest in. 
Um, and so a guy named Ray Lane and Namol Despande, uh, uh, two partners there, really stuck their neck out and said, you know, this is, this is an idea that's worth pursuing. And it was controversial at the time. Um, but they, they got behind the company and Ray is still on the board today and, and, and enormously important person within the company. Um, and, uh, and took the chance. Now, of course, there's a lot more stuff going on in the Valley today. But back when they made that investment, it was pretty controversial, and, and they've stuck with us, and it's it made all the difference. Have you had any high-profile people invest in your company, and do you think that's helped? Yeah, we've been very fortunate on that front. I mean, enormously uh, fortunate, whether it's you know, folks I just mentioned, to Kleiner, um, to, to Bill Gates, to, um, to the founder of Twitter, uh, Biz, and uh, Biz Stone, and Evan Williams. Um, uh, all along the, all along the way, you see uh, really uh, interesting, constructive people getting involved. Seth Goldman, who's the founder of Honest Tea, um, uh, just the number of you know uh, really important funds and, and people have gotten behind what we're doing. And I think that's indicative of importance, right? It's not. I don't think it's anything particular about what we do. It's the idea, right, that you no longer need to use an animal to create a piece of meat. How do you? How do you think about eliminating that bottleneck like you've thought about that hundreds of times, thousands of times in other industries? When you first started the company, was it were you thinking about getting those kind of people involved? Was it a strategic thing for you to get those people involved? And how did you do that? That's a good question. Um, I was thinking more about the outcome that I was seeking when I started the company. Um, I did. I did have a plan to um, to approach uh, venture funds. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, I was sort of just myopically focused on growing the business. And, you know, I, I think very much so that if you, um, uh, dedicate yourself to, to something that is a calling that, and it's the right calling and it's something that, that benefits, uh, something broader than yourself, that amazing things will happen. You know, that's been my experience anyway. And See? I think. The, I think these people getting involved is, uh, reflect um, the power of the idea, basically. So you focus on the business, and you're saying the rest is kind of taking care of itself. I think so. If you, if you do a good job uh, and, and sort of stay true to your mission, and, and, and you know, think strategically, and you know, try to reward the investors, etc., I think really good people will come to, to support you. Uh, the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, recently uh, told the world it needs to move to a vegan diet in a recent speech. What kind of political support have Beyond Meat got? That's, That's, if a, good any. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I would say almost none. None? Yeah. I mean, I think the government uh, is in a tricky place on this one, um, like like anything. I mean, they just they, they have a lot of invested... Um, you know, a lot of vested interests that 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 are that are not aligned with what we're trying to do. Um, so I wouldn't say the government's a strong uh, source of support for us. Do you see that as a barrier? Yeah. When you- I think they should just. To my view on government is that they should level the playing field in this in this regard. It's not my political view more generally, but in this regard, level the playing field. <laughs> Uh, in terms of subsidies, you mean? everything, yeah, yeah, just get 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 rid of the things that are that are distorting the market uh, and allow us to compete. I mean, that's the biggest thing that they could do. Uh, we don't need a handout, we don't need uh, special treatment, but to just create a level playing field where we can compete is the right thing to do. When you look at the subsidies, uh, I don't have the numbers in on the top of my head, but they're massive. A lot of, subsid- a lot of money goes to subsidise the meat and dairy industry. Has that given you a massive headache in terms of trying to get your new products um, cheap enough to compete with those subsidized products? It's a great question. It does make it harder. It does. It does make it harder. And there's there's both the direct subsidies and then there's the externalities that just aren't accounted for. Um, you know, uh, all kinds of all kinds of things. Um, and so that does make it more difficult to compete. Um, but I think that the consumer interest in this is stronger than that. Like the consumer interest will like battle through that, and and we just have to stay really attuned to what the consumer wants. And it'd be better if those subsidies weren't there, um, but uh, it's not what keeps me up at night. When you say the consumer interest will drive your company, are you implying that you think consumer interests will change in the future as more people become aware? Of- it's amazing to me. I mean, I, I, I again, I, you know, it's it's. I think it's far broader than anything we're doing, um, but you know we can't fill orders today. We have too much demand, um, and that was not the case five years ago. 
you know, it was it was much more of an uphill battle. Part of his brand recognition, but part of the consumer is changing and changing very quickly. Like there's just so much more. I mean, how could they not? Like, there's so much more information out there. Like, I mean, you're in this field. Every six months, a new study comes out, says something positive about a plant-based diet, you know, uh, or or something comes out about climate and everything else. It's this perfect storm that's emerging around this idea, and I think we're the, we thankfully are in a place where we can benefit from it. Do you think there'll be a price decrease as uh, the population takes up plant-based Absolutely. alternatives? Absolutely. So the fact that we're selling today in the meat, in the meat case, at a price that's you know, roughly competitive with, like, let's say, organic grass-fed beef. If, if you did a heat map, for example, of our facilities and those of like Purdue, for example, or or Cargill or something, it wouldn't even show up. Like, we, you know, we'd be like an outhouse. You know? <laughs> and like, um, imagine as we start to get scale, what we can do. And it's like, if you just think back to like a basic economics textbook, there's enormous inefficiency in the production model with animal agriculture. We don't have that inefficiency. We have gotten, you know, if you think about that value chain, there's there's something that, that is is using a tremendous amount of resources to produce the same output that we can produce with far less. We should be cheaper. Mm-hmm. When you go to investors and uh, meetings in that realm, what's the main marker of your success? Do you talk about how many products you've sold, or do you talk about how well your products mimic real meat? Um, so I think I'm the first to say that our products aren't there yet. I mean, I think they're they're good. I think that the the one that we have released today, uh, this Beyond Burger, is the best thing we've ever done. Um, I think the earlier products reflect the best that we could do at the time. Um, but you know, we have to be relentless in our pursuit of the the um, the structure of meat, the the mouthfeel, the sensory experience of meat, and and you know, we'll get there for sure. I mean, uh, and I joke with the scientists here that it's a lifetime employment project for them. Like we've been consuming meat, you know, as humans and as our predecessors for about 2 million years. We're not going to get it right in seven years. Like it's going to take longer, but every year we, our commitment to the consumer is to put out the best thing that we can do. And we do get better every year. Um, and so I think with investors, it's really around, um, helping them to understand the way that we fit into the trend and the way that we can help enable the trend by providing better products. I was going to get onto the Beyond Gut. Beyond Burger, sure. you mentioned it. Yeah, let's talk about that. Sure, I'm, I love this burger. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, it's uh, it's. Um, I'm just very proud of the people that did it. Uh, you know, there's a group of scientists here that, that we uh, we have a center here called the Manhattan Beach Project, which is because it's near Manhattan Beach, but also <clears throat> uh, we named it that because we wanted to um, instill within them the understanding that what they're doing is global significance. We wanted to instill within them the understanding that they, we felt that and feel that they are the brightest scientists that can be working on this problem. And they're from you know, the best schools, they're from all over the world, um, and that there's a global and urgent nature to what they're doing. And this, you know, this Beyond Burger, I think, is the first product that really is the outgrowth of that center. And you know, I think what, what excites me about it, you know, one is the response has been great, which is really, really nice. Um, it was sold out. I was just talking to our sales guy. You know, we're rivaling organic grass-fed beef right now in, in terms of movement uh, in, in, in certain stores. Um, what do you mean by that in terms of movement? In just numbers, like u- units per week, things like that. Like So in the stores where we're selling, so the whole idea was to get into the meat case where the consumer can make the right choice. You know, Do I want uh, plant-based meat or an animal-based meat? And we're seeing that, uh, that consumers are buying this at a clip at a rate that is uh, equal to or exceeding grass-fed beef in certain, in certain locations. We launched in, I can't give the numbers, but we just launched in the center city, Philadelphia. The numbers were astronomical, which was really exciting, you know? And, and so I think, but what excites me more about the, the, um, the product is, is really, you can begin to see like a window to the future with it. You can sort of see like, okay, this is, this part's not perfect, but we understand how to make it better. Right. And, you know, so let's say the distribution of fat isn't exactly how it needs to be. But they're coming up with ways to get it to the point where it will be almost exactly like it's distributed in, in animal muscle. So and that, to me, is really exciting. Yeah, you've always been really confident about that. What gives you that confidence? Obviously, it helps your marketing by being confident and saying we are going to get there. Right. But do you honestly think you will? And how do you know that? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's an absolute foundational belief. Like uh, it's um, because there's no. I mean, so we're not going to put we're not going to make a plant based cholesterol, right? And that's not really even possible, but. But um, but all of the things that really contribute to the sensory experience of meat 
we can drive from plants. And so I guess I have the confidence because I've just seen it. You know, and we can't do everything at scale that we can do in our lab. Um, but the, I think the way to think about it is that we've seen no material obstacle to doing it. Eric Smith recently came out and ranked plant-based meat as the most important trend in tech, beating right. things like 3D printing, self-driving cars, and virtual reality. Right. He said it's the most important trend in tech. As somebody who works in this industry, do you well, get what's that, the second one? Do you get that sense? The second one was self-driving. Yeah, so there are things like virtual reality, right. self-driving cars, artificial intelligence. Right, okay, got it. Okay, okay. Um, do you get the sense of the importance of this industry, of this this industry, having worked in it? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think he's right on the. I mean, I don't know about the other stuff, but but on on the plant-based side, um, I can't think of anything. And one of the things that motivates me so much about the company, and I think our investors, is literally as a, as a mental exercise when you're flying back to the UK or whatever. Think about this, like what single change we make that simultaneously attacks all four of those all, all four of those issues human health climate natural resource animal welfare than this like what's more important than doing this if you want to attack all four of those things at once i've never seen anything in my life where you can make such an impact by focusing on one thing like that to me so i worked in fuel cells for example before great technology will be here someday uh really good for for climate right but imagine being able to do something that's really good for climate and good for human health like that's really exciting What's your relationship like with companies such as uh, Impossible Foods? You know, Pat's Pat's uh, a really good guy um, and uh, someone I respect a lot. And I know him you know, personally. We've had lunch and things like that and been on panels together. And, um, a panel together. Uh, and talk on the phone. We have in the past. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just it's a $2 billion, $200 billion industry here in the United States. Uh, so there's plenty of room. And I think that the more people out there doing this, probably the better. I mean, sure, we're competitive. Um, how could you not be? But but I think we're both pulling for each other. Um, and uh, we take, we're taking different approaches, too. So it'll be very interesting to see how the market reacts. What's your relationship uh, like with companies like Hampton Creek? Do you know Josh Tetrick? Um, yeah, I, mean, I do know him. I do know him. Uh, and I know Josh Bulk a, a lot better um, and, and think very highly of Josh Bulk. I don't know Tetrick well. Do you feel like uh, there's any way you guys can further all of your companies if you work together? You know, I, there's just so much going on here. You know, that, that there's been efforts to try to build a, a coalition within, the, within the, 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 the plant-based community, and I think it's a good one. I, I just, we're just so focused on what we got going on here. It's just like not enough time in the day yet. But ultimately, yeah, would it be good to have like a, um, you know, I mean, the Got Milk campaign for example came out of the milk board. Would it be good to have something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think, you know, there's a time for that. Uh, let's talk about lab-grown meats. Do you think these are like pie-in-the-sky distraction? No. No, I, I, I had recently the opportunity to, to spend some time um, with the uh, gentleman who runs uh, Memphis Meat, uh, who I think highly of. Um, I don't think it's traction at all. I looked at that technology a lot in the mid 2000s uh, and before I started this company. And I'd come from, as I mentioned, from you know clean tech for energy. And I was hesitant about getting involved in something else where I couldn't see a clear path to commercialization. I think they will commercialize it, but I didn't, you know, I've often said like technology is like no regard for your career. It's going to be ready when it's ready. And I didn't want to get involved in something that, that couldn't contribute in my lifetime to what I was trying to do. And I think they'll figure it out. And I, I've heard the sort of five years out, that type of thing. Um, and I welcome that. I think it'll be interesting. You say you welcome that. Do you not see it as a threat to your business? No, not really. Why not? Um, I think because the size of the market is so big and I think that, um, you know, I mean, we're going to attack this problem every way we can. Uh, and, um, yeah, I just don't see, I mean, yeah, sure. If it, if it, if it somehow materialized in a way that was negative for us, uh, yeah, it would obviously be concerning, but it's a very big market. I think that's pretty far off. What do you say to people who say you're an animal rights activist working within capitalism? Well, that's a good question. Um, That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. I have, the, I have the tremendous blessing and good fortune to be able to work on something that's so important to me, like in my heart and, and, and who I am. 
um, I don't think of myself in those terms, really. I just think of someone, I mean, I'm not trying to be skirts a question. Like, I just think about someone who's trying to get something done. Um, and people need to eat food and they need to eat protein. And um, I think that it would be amazing to be part of a generation that is the first to separate meat from animals. And that, I mean, that, that's the, the, the level at which I think about it. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for for Ingrid and for for the PETA and for Humane Society, and but I also have a lot of respect for people that you know have raised dairy cattle and have raised uh, uh, you know uh, beef cattle. Uh, they come at the world in two different ways. Um, I obviously have to decide with the view that that um, animals are more than production units, uh, but um, but uh, you have to be. Uh, willing to meet people where they are, um, and uh, particularly in a consumer-facing business, you really have to pay attention to that. Um, and I'd like to innovate our way out of the problem. I'd like to have our cake and eat it too, so to speak. I'd like to create meat from plants and, and retire this debate, basically. Um, and I think it'd be a pretty amazing thing to do that. Are there any strategies or techniques that Beyond Meat utilize that you've learned from unethical businesses? I mean, I could give you a couple, but I feel like I'd be singling out companies um I, I think so here's 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 an area that i think is important is is um you'll be truthful with your consumer like no one wants to be lied to or tricked or you know um over you know don't over or don't overemphasize something you know or make claims that just aren't can't be substantiated i mean i think that those are those are it's too frequent in our society where like you know, with my son the other day they're just billboards just having to explain to him that the billboard is it's marketing tool like it's not literal like you can't actually trust that you know and I, and I would like to be the company that is you know you can trust what we say can people trust you when you constantly bombard people with the messaging that you need protein when you've got a whole host of medical doctors saying you get enough protein from fruit vegetables legumes and grains right um yeah i mean i uh, i don't know that um we we don't prescribe any level of protein at all. Um, it's more just if you want to have a piece of meat, we have a piece of meat for you, but it's made from plants. Like it's up to you guys. You know, if, if you wanted to eat, you know, just grains and, and legumes, that's great. <laughs> yeah. What are the biggest challenges in your your mission and your campaign? The, the 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 main barriers holding you back. Right, where I'm impatient is on the product quality. Um, you know, I think we have the best product on the market. I think the Beyond Burger is, is better than any other burger that's on the market, for sure. Um, but it's not good enough, you know, and uh, I think continue to make it better. Um, I mean, I eat it all the time. You know, everyone who eats it seems to love it. But we know that it can be better. And so I think the impatience is around and the barriers are around just the rate of progress. And it's not slow. We're progressing incredibly quickly. But given the urgency of the issue, it's, it, it, it can be... You know, there's a level of impatience around it. More generally, the biggest threat to this industry, what do you think? That you kind of talked about the barriers right. for right. your company, what do you think the biggest threat is? Animal meat is so ingrained in who we are that to make that transition is hard. It's not the same as, as disrupting you know, a landline, and a cell phone, or a uh, you know, new form of computing. It's, it's, this is deep, deep, deep within our DNA. Um, but I have enough faith in the fact that consumers are drawn to better and if we can create better uh, for them in a way that's truly satisfying they'll come so there's something that we think about a lot which is what we call it the meat gap where the consumption of meat is declining but the rate in meat replacement or plant-based meat that in terms of replacing that is not exactly uh, it's, it's not keeping up at all actually so there's a very big gap if you look at the dairy case that gap doesn't exist right it's it's you see decline in dairy and you see the massive uh, rise in, in plant-based uh, beverages. Um, and so uh, I think that speaks all to the product, the, the quality of the product. Like if, if, if there were products there that were readily accessible in the same location that people buy meat, animal meat, uh, you would see uh, that meat cap disappear and it'd be filled with plant-based meat. Lastly, do you have any advice for people who want to start an ethical business? Um, I think a general piece of advice around or advice for business, uh, people who are interested in starting businesses. Um, you know, I went to business school and, and uh, 
and one of the classes I took there was an entrepreneur class. And the guy used to always bring back uh, people who would start a business and were very successful. You know, they're like generally like pretty good looking, pretty young. And uh, I always just like want to raise my hand and be like, where are the, all the people you like, they're living with their mom right now <laughs> you know, because they like took your advice to go start a business and failed. So I think you have to uh, be uh, willing to fail. You know, like really, like don't have a safety net. Don't be like, well, you know, I'll try this for six months and I'll go back because it's so difficult to do it that you will, if you have a safety net, you'll probably take it. All right. And so for me, I initially had, you know, I won't spend this account. I won't sell this house. You know, I always have it. And I just got rid of all that. Like I, you had to go through it, you know? And so at some point you have to be successful. You have no other choice. And so to, to make sure that you care enough about what you're doing, that you're willing to do things that. You know, when you began, you weren't sure you would be willing to do, but, but you know, it's it, that process almost of getting your back against the wall is when some of that best thing comes out when you have to do something. And so positioning yourself to, to, to be willing to fail, to, uh, to believe in it so strongly that, that you'd surprise yourself even in how persistent you'll be. is really important. So don't pick a wrong business. Don't pick a business that you're sort of lukewarm about. The other piece was that the other thing that in business world, I always found funny was that they would always tell you like, you make sure there's a competitive moat around what you're doing. Like, don't go into something where other people are, are, are um, you know, there's a lot of other, other competition. I just don't believe that. Like, I think if you, have, if you have a strong enough idea and you're willing to be better than anybody else, you can ent enter the most crowded field possible. Um, and, you know, the examples of that are everywhere. Um, so don't be shy. If you have a vision and you have a calling for it, you know, go for it.